all that stuff. All right, so my friends, welcome to the uh, second call of the second week of the first cohort of Nebula. Uh, so we are delighted to have you here today. We've run through all of our standard uh, reminders um, just to make sure that everyone's on the same footing here. Um, uh, so first of all, I'll pull up my Etherpad. So we've been posting the Etherpad notes regularly in the chat. If you've not yet had the chance, please do add your name, line 22. Choose maybe some beautiful color. Maybe you've got a soothing blue or a bright, bright purple that you just need to express your very own personality. Um, and if you want to choose a color for when you're typing on that etherpad, that's over on the top right. Uh, right now it says seven, where it says show the users on this pad, and you can select a color for yourself, as well as potentially adding an emoji uh, to talk about how you're feeling. And Denise, loving the trees. International Forest Day sounds delightful. Um, okay, so um, we've already done the webcam reminders. So this call is recorded. We're already being recorded right now. You may even be watching us on YouTube, uh, on our YouTube channel at uh, YouTube slash Open Life uh, We also have captions available. So if I'm speaking a bit too fast or my accent's a little bit odd for you, um, or maybe you're hard of hearing, there's many reasons, but we, op we offer those captions. Um, and you can follow them in real time. The link is in the Etherpad on line 35. It's in the chat, or if you're using Zoom, then it's on the top left corner. For me, it says otter.ai. Click here to open live transcript. Um, we have a code of conduct. Generally, that means be awesome to one another. Um, being awesome is never simple, though. Please read it. Um, and if at any point you feel like the things that you've experienced or witnessed perhaps aren't in line with the way that you should be treated or in line with the code of conduct, we want to know so we can make sure that it's less likely to happen again. Uh, you can report that to myself. Um, or So we have several names on the Etherpad. There's line 38. If you email team at werols.org, that will reach uh, multiple people. If it's about an individual and you don't want to reach lots of people, then you can email myself, uh, Malvika or Irene. Um, and this is whether you've experienced it yourself or whether it's something you've witnessed. So it doesn't have to be just that something bad happened to you or undesirable happened to you. It can be that you saw something. Uh, we will be having some breakout rooms in this call today. Uh, so if you've joined these calls before, I can tell quite a few of you have because I can see those S's and W's. But just as a quick reminder, um, we have the option for spoken breakout rooms. That's people speaking like I am now out loud with my microphone. Uh, but sometimes you're in a hotel or you have a baby or there's many reasons why you might choose to actually want to be quiet. Uh, so we have written interaction in breakout rooms as well. If you prefer written interaction, please edit your Zoom name and add W for written in front of your name. If you prefer spoken interaction, edit your Zoom name and add an S in front of your name. So right now I'm gonna do that myself. So I've clicked on the participants, then I click on my name. I click on the button, there's a blue button for me that says re uh, more, and then I click rename. Uh, and then I can actually modify my Zoom name and I've added W in front of my name so that I can participate in a written breakout room. Um, I'm going to say those were all of the introductory things. So, uh, Irene, I think you're going to do the next sections here. Yes, thank you, Joe. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly just to um, share where we are at the program. Are you seeing my screen now? Okay, thank you. So we are, as Joe was saying, on the second week, that is the second module, the module of open tools and resources. Um, in the last session, Japsia shared with us um, how to assemble different open strategies uh, throughout the research process so from beginning to end. And this is, uh, an open science strategy and data management plan. And we're gonna do, what we're gonna do today is to start uh, looking into more detail um, into some of the tools 
that are very foundational in open science. This include metadata, documentation, repositories, and persistent identifiers. And these concepts, we're gonna kind of go over them again in the next modules, but we're gonna kind of, this is a, an introduction, and then we're gonna see how they apply specifically for data, for code, and for publications um, in the following weeks. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Saranjit. I'm gonna stop sharing. And so Saranjit is our expert for this call. Um, and yeah, Saranjit, can you tell us a little bit about yourself before your presentation, please? Yes, uh, thanks, Irene. Uh, thanks, Yo. Uh, my name is Saranjit Kaur Bhogal, and this is my very first time hosting a cohort call uh, as an expert. Uh, I've been associated with OLS since uh, OLS cohort four. So 2021, I think, long time. Um, I also had the opportunity to contribute uh, to the um, uh, NASA uh, module on open tools and resources from which this current uh, cohort call is being inspired from. So uh, I had an opportunity to interact with uh, several experts in that uh, uh, during that uh, session and uh, help develop the initial material for Open Science 101 curriculum. Um, I'm based in India. It's around 9.42 p.m. for me. So you might find my energy a little low, but I'll try my best to uh, to, to remain excited throughout the call. Um, uh, that's all about me. So uh, I'll be sharing a bit about the different open tools uh, that really help on your open science journey. Uh, it's like it's really exciting to see that there is now a course or a whole cohort call that can, that helps uh, people get introduced to these tools. Uh, when like when I started, it was something that I learned uh, from the community by talking to people, listening to others. But it's really nice to see uh, Open Life Science taking this initiative to um, uh, conduct such cohort calls. So. Yeah, that's that's a bit about me. So if it's okay, I can start my session now. All right. <laughs> okay, I just saw your comment now. You <laughs> you taught them how to do it. They're just the space scientists. You're the expert. <laughs> okay. Um. So let me know if you can see my screen. All right. So welcome again to the Nebula Pilot Cohort Week 2 Cohort Call. This is uh, the topic for this call is General Tools for Open Science. And uh, what we are specifically going to discuss here is metadata, documentation, repositories, and persistent identifiers. Um, uh, like I mentioned before, all the material on this slide and the topics that we are discussing are inspired from the Open Science 101 curriculum uh, by NASA Transform to Open Science program. All right, so what uh, essentially uh, we are going to discuss today. Uh, so we will be looking at four different stories which helped us understand what is metadata, why is documentation important for open science, what are repositories and why they are useful, and what are persistent identifiers and why to use them. Um, I'll, I'll try to uh, share uh, different scenarios and make a comparison with uh, how you use it in your day-to-day -day research work, and we'll see and we'll try to understand what are these different terms. So the first scenario is uh, if you're looking uh, for a specific book in a library, so what would you do? How, how would you find that book? So you would go on to look for the title, the author, the subject. When you know this information, when you know these labels and tags, you can go and find that specific book in the library. So what these labels and tags are doing, uh, uh, are working or helping you find a book in a similar way, there is this term called as metadata, which, uh, which is nothing but information or data about your data set. So what it, it does, it helps you to organize, find, and understand your data. 
So this is what metadata does. So this is how you need to remember metadata is nothing but some data about your bigger data set. Um, it could be embedded in the data or it could be as a separate data file. So separate to your data file. So a metadata can be part of your data set or it can you have a bunch of data files and then you have a metadata file. Now what we will do is we will try to uh, understand what kind of information is available in metadata. So metadata would, uh, now you would see that there is a lot of text on this slide, but then I'm going to also share some examples which will help you to understand how metadata looks. So there is no one uh, specific structure to metadata, but it can answer a bunch of different questions, like how the data was collected, how it was processed, what variables are present in the data set, uh, who collected the data, for example, the name of the team or the organization or the people, uh, where you can find that data, how you can cite it. So such kind of information is usually uh, present in metadata. And uh, why it is uh, so essential to open science is because it helps, like I pro gave the example of finding books in a library. What do you need is the label tags title. So these tags and title also help you to find the data set or uniquely identify or search the data set in an archive. So your metadata, once you have information on the metadata, you can uh, get access to the data set or you would know uh, where exactly the data set sits. Also, it's uh, very easy to share. Usually it is very easy to share metadata than sharing the entire data set. So if you, if you could, uh, if you wanted to share uh, some data set and instead of that, you uh, provided the metadata to that data set, uh, the other person can uniquely identify or look or find a set that you are referring to. So now the first type of metadata is descriptive metadata. In descriptive metadata, uh, what you have is the content uh, or the context of your data, the kind of information present in descriptive metadata. I'll, I'll share an example of what a descriptive metadata looks like. So this is a abstract from uh, the Journal of Open Source Software paper. So when you submit a paper to the Journal of Open Source Software, you, they ask you to provide a certain description of who you are, who your team is, and what the paper is about. So you give information about the title of the paper, you provide some keywords, you give information of who the author is, um, and what are their affiliations. So such kind of in descriptive information that you're providing uh, that would uniquely identify that uh, paper is nothing but the descriptive metadata that you're providing to the Journal of Open Source Software. So if, uh, if I've uh, shared the slides uh, on the notepad and when we reach the activity, you can uh, click on the link of uh, the source of this image and from there you would uh, get to go to the journal of open source software submission guidelines and you would see how this whole thing is structured uh, in that paper the other type of metadata is structural metadata so it essentially describes the structure of the data uh, which could be the file format the dimensions the hierarchy so what i did i couldn't find a appropriate example so i created a folder on my laptop uh, to show you how a structural metadata might look so in in this image uh, there is the name of the file the date modified the size of the file and what is the file format or the kind of the file so this kind of uh, data is nothing but structural metadata so if i know the name of the file uh, or the size or the type of the file, I can uniquely go and find where this file is inside my laptop. So this is an example of a structural metadata. Uh, then the next type uh, is called as the administrative metadata. So what this kind of data uh, metadata shares is information of how uh, the software or the data set was created, the version of the software, uh, what uh, which software was used in data creation. So as an example, uh, I've, I've provided a snippet 
uh, from the R package uh, splines to. And in this uh, snippet, uh, there is the version of uh, the software, what it depends on, what packages it imports. So all this kind of administrative stuff, which when it was published, so all this administrative information could be classified as administrative metadata of that software or of that package. So uh, that's all about metadata, a short introduction to metadata. Yeah, we now have a one small activity. Uh, you can try to identify metadata for any data set or any software that uh, you use often in your research and um, try to think about what kind of metadata is it? Uh, is it uh, administrative? Is it descriptive? Uh, is it structural? Uh, and uh, I think uh, we can move into breakout rooms or... Uh, and you can discuss amongst yourself how, uh, what are your thoughts about this, uh, uh, this activity. So it's more of a reflection exercise. Do do we have the breakout rooms uh, ready? Or oh, yo, Irene? Yeah, I'm, I'm finishing assigning participants before I open them. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay, so I'm gonna open the breakout rooms for um, five minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're not expected to write anything, uh, but you're uh, free to make any notes on the notepad. Uh, this is more of a reflection exercise. Uh, try to think about the data sets or softwares that you're using regularly or frequently uh, and see if you can understand uh, where the metadata or where the metadata for that software or data set sits and how it looks like. Okay, I opened the breakout rooms um, and you should be able to join now. Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, hopefully you had a good discussion. Um, Serenjit, over to you. Yep, I'm um, eager to know if anybody has any thoughts, any questions, or wanted to share what they were discussing in their rooms. Any any volunteers? You can always, uh, yes, uh, Priya. You can always yes. Can you hear me? Chat. Yes, I can hear you well. Yeah, okay. Uh, with the activity, I was um, figuring out that we need to identify these data sets from what we are working on. So was that the right thing or? Yeah, yeah. To, uh, okay, so that that would mean it will differ for um, each field of expertise yeah. for the people, right? Okay. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Thank you. Yes, it would differ according to your field and the different types. Uh, there, there would also be uh, different norms around how uh, metadata is defined in a specific discipline. So yeah, it was more of a reflection exercise uh, to think what part of the data sets that you are using in your field uh, could be labeled as a metadata, metadata or could be classified as a metadata. Um, I also saw Lutiana raising her hand. Did you want to share anything, Lutiana? Yes, I can share some thoughts on that. And the thoughts we, we were discussing in there, it's like I'm from a legal background and often we are not very explicit about the metadata and how this is an area of improvement and also of self-critique that we have to think and rethink about the metadata and making it, it really easily accessible to other people who are reading our, our reports. That's an interesting thing uh, to think of. I don't come from a legal background, so I might not have uh, much to provide there. But yeah, we can we can always continue these discussions and learn more. Um, uh, there is a question on the chat by Dennis. Uh, they ask, would MATLAB codes be administrative metadata uh, or same with QGIS or ArcGIS having administrative metadata. Uh, so what I feel is uh, 
in in your code files each file itself might have some part of metadata which, which could be descriptive metadata then the structure of uh, the entire package or uh, a package in matlab uh, that could be classified as structural metadata um and uh, there so because we are also talking about software so there is also administrative metadata because it might include information like version the date it was published what it depends on so uh, there is uh, in a given piece of software you cannot say that there is only uh, administrative metadata or only structural metadata you could find different uh, metadata types in one piece of software or in one piece of data set so uh, uh, we are not classifying uh, matlab as only administrative as having only administrative metadata it might have different meta uh, data at different places in the software or piece of package uh, does that help dennis yes thank you all right all right uh, uh, just uh, super quickly um i want to double check is it denise as the pronunciation denise yes that's <laughs> thank right. you yeah okay. sarenji just just for context often dennis tends to be a guy's name and denise tends to be the feminine uh -huh. um, okay i i didn't know that okay okay denise okay um uh, so there is another question from Edris. Hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Uh, are dependencies of software packages administrative or structural or so dependencies uh, would be, uh, yes, that would be administrative. So uh, like I had shared the example of our package splines two, and there was a section called as dependencies and it, it can be, it, it would be classified as administrative information about uh, about the about the package address uh, did you like does that help uh, okay another one from priya so I, i'll take this as the last question and then we can continue these discussions later on where we have time for open discussion um so would a storage related website from university that helps employees to exchange large data files with each other and also serve as a common repository for all be called as administrative data um so uh, this uh, this question would be more appropriate to one of the later sections it would be a, um, a more of an organizational repository rather than calling it as an administrative metadata because uh, like you are explaining it is something that uh, people in a university are using to uh, share uh, information with each other. So that might be an organizational repository, uh, what you're thinking of. Uh, metadata is nothing but the high level information about the data set. It is not uh, the entire data. The entire data is not called the metadata. It is just the information of the data set. So it's like the label of the book not the entire book. But then if you have the label, you can always <laughs> uh, get to the book. So, all right. So let us continue uh, with the slides now. Okay. So, all right. So now the next part or the second story so for example uh, you're really excited uh, to write a code and you have been uh, doing a lot of research and writing a lot of code today and um, so for the past week you have been writing huge amounts of code uh, okay Sorry. So yeah, so you've been writing a huge amount of code and uh, really excited, really making a lot of changes to it. And it's all the information is really fresh in your mind. But what happens is uh, you do it now and you complete the code and you're really happy about what you did. Uh, however, uh, in six months time, you are revisiting the same code 
and now you're really frustrated because you cannot remember uh, why you defined a certain variable a certain way or uh, why did you write a particular line of code um, or uh, why did you introduce a new step uh, at a certain stage in the code. So uh, this is a, a, a common scenario when we don't do one of the most important uh, things uh, that open science recommends, which is nothing but documentation. So documentation, when you document your own work, you're being your own best collaborator. So this also helps you to help your future self so that you can uh, recall uh, what you did months back or years back. So this is one very important aspect uh, in open science, try to document your work. So, and as we proceed further, we will understand that uh, we not only uh, need to document uh, our research paper, but there are also uh, different stages when you're developing your research work, you can document all of that as well. Uh, and what are the benefits of documentation? The first one, uh, I would say, I've put it second, but I think that should be the first one. It helps you to recall whatever details you had uh, included in the process. So whatever meticulous details you had done and you had written such a beautiful code uh, six months earlier, it helps you to recall what you did then. And then uh, once you have documented, it's also easy to reference and reuse uh, what you have documented already in the past. So uh, like I was uh, saying, uh, you need not only think about, uh, by documentation, you need not always think about writing a research paper. You also need to think about how you can document your data. So documentation of data is also very essential. Uh, for example, how you would document data um, so what you could uh, write in the documentation of, of the data, so it could be a user guide about that data set or a readme file of, the, of that data set and you can uh, include information on what are the errors that you know about this data set, how can this data set be used, how was the data collected, how, uh, if anybody else has used this data, then how did they use it? So all this information, which is usually very fresh in our minds when we are collecting or uh, generating data sets, uh, after a while we forget all this information. So it's always good to create a user guide or a readme file about your data set and include all this information in that uh, file. As an example, uh, I have taken um, a screenshot uh, from the photovoltaic solar panel energy generation data provided by UK Power Networks. I don't think uh, this is the best of font to be put on a slide, but uh, I'll try to explain what is there in the image. So what they do is they are trying to describe the data set. Uh, you can go on this website. Uh, I've provided a link on the uh, slides. So if you click on that link, you can go and download this data set. But in addition to this data set, they have also provided some uh, information about this data set. For example, what are the key stats? What are the variables included in it, um, like voltage, current, power, energy, who this project or who collected this uh, data? So all this information uh, is um, mentioned in this uh, in this file or on this website. So this is an example of how you could document your data set. Another example that I can uh, think of is if, if any one of you have been using Kaggle, then they also provide open data sets. So if you uh, open any of their open data sets, you would see a, a, a section called as data card. And in that data card, they give information about what the data is. Uh, what kind of problem they are trying to solve, who collected the data, what variables are there in the data. So all this is uh, a nice way or a nice approach to uh, document your data. Uh, I'm not sure if I should be checking this. Uh, okay. It's just trying to confuse you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Yo. Uh, okay. So that's about uh, documenting data. So uh, going forward, uh, let us uh, take the approach that we don't think of documentation only at the paper writing stage. We also think it about when we are collecting our data and try to uh, make notes about what the data set is about. So this is about documenting data. The other uh, place where we, ne we need to be documenting is the software itself. 
So how do you document the software is by including readme files uh, where you could uh, put the basic installation instructions or how to use instructions. Then in, in the code file itself, when you're writing your code, then you could put inline comments through annotations. You can put comments in the code and then that helps you to whenever you're coming back to this uh, piece of software in a a uh, few months time, you can recall what you did uh, way back. Then uh, also when uh, uh, there are release notes with software, so a given package or a given software could be uh, updated over a period of time. And when it's getting updated, then the maintainers or whoever are the contributors also provide release notes about what the updates are in the software. So this is also uh, a way of documenting uh, what all information is in the software. So I have uh, provided an example of uh, the R package. So you, you might see R uh, quite uh, often in these slides because I come from statistics background. So I have an inclination uh, to giving examples from R. So this, this is a package called Shiny. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Shiny, but it's a package that helps you to create different interactive apps in R. Um, so if you look at the readme, so in the image, there is the readme file of the Shiny package. And what information is present is how you can install a stable version of this software, uh, where you can get started. And then uh, if you go on the link, you would get further more information in the readme file. So this is example of how to document a software. This is one example, but then, uh, and it's the readme file, but then softwares can also be documented while writing the code itself. So you could always write comments on the code and uh, that is also one way to document your software. Uh, the third uh, important uh, time or phase in your research where you should be documenting is to document your results. So you write about what the research process was, what packages were used, what software were used, and then all this information when you provide uh, about your results, what data, what software you were using to get those results, then if somebody else performs the same task, he would be able to regenerate your results and reproduce the results that you have uh, uh, through your experiments. Um, uh, here is an example of how uh, doc you could document results. So this is example on how to compile reports from R scripts. So it gives detailed information of what you need to do to regenerate the results of this uh, particular task. So uh, this is your, oh, I moved too fast. So this is how you would uh, document your results. So. Uh, going forward, let us learn three principles that uh, the first, okay, four principles that we don't think of documentation only at research paper writing stage. We also think about it uh, when we are working with the data. We also think about it when we are uh, working with the software and also uh, when uh, we are uh, working with the results. So try to document all these processes. Okay, time for another activity. Or if you need a break, we can take a break after this activity or before. Do we need to give a break now? We can or... go straight okay. to the activity. All right. Okay. So again, uh, think of the data sets or softwares that you're using and uh, look up if uh, there are any official documentations available for that software or data set. Um, if not, uh, you can also think about where now that you know that documentation is important, you can think of where you can start with including documentation in your research work. So if you want, you can move into the breakout rooms now once they are open. Give me a minute, I'm changing some participants. Mm -hmm. Okay, they are open now for five minutes as well. Thanks, Irene.
I think everyone is back in the room. Okay, welcome back. Uh, over to part three. So we are 50% there. 50% more to go. <laughs> and uh, we'll finish soon. So don't worry. Uh, do we need to take a break now? Or uh, it's fine, we can continue. We usually don't um, have to break, uh, have to take breaks, because it's a short session. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you can continue. But thanks right. for checking. All right. Okay, so uh, now we are in the last 50% part of this session. Uh, this is uh, story number three. Uh, so what you need to think of is that you are a researcher and you're working on a project to understand the effect of uh, medicine on the specific health condition of people. So during this research, you're conducting some surveys you're collecting some patient demographics, you're doing some tests in a chemical laboratory, you're also accessing medical records. So you're collecting many different kinds of uh, data during this research work. So the challenge that you would have is, uh, where would you be storing all these different data sets that you're collecting? So the answer is uh, in repositories. So repositories are the storage locations for um, the data sets or the code that you write uh, during your research work. So you can store your data, your results, your code, your compiled software in a repository. So this is the location where you will put all this information that you're collecting. And uh, why should we put it in repositories is because you are collecting so much different data. For example, uh, traditionally, if we are doing this um, uh, using the other methods, like we are putting all the data in a pen drive, or maybe you're collecting all information on, uh, on surveys. Uh, so all this information could be uh, easily uh, findable and easily preserved if you put it on repositories. And also that way it's easier to share the information or the data that you have collected with other people. So uh, remember, whenever you uh, think of uh, where to store the data set, it could be anything. So it could be numeric data, it could be images, uh, it could be the, the code that you're writing. Uh, try to explore how you could do it uh, using repositories. So one of the uh, repositories uh, that uh, I would recommend you to explore is Zenodo. So it's an archiving repository for individual releases of your data, your software, or any publications. So I became a great fan of Zenodo when I realized I can also put up my slides, uh, the presentations that I create. So I can put up my slides on Zenodo and, and then I can share a link uh, to that to anybody else who wants to view my slides. So it's a it's a very nice way uh, to share information uh, in, in, in your community. So this is an example of a Zenodo repository. It is uh, about the illustrations from the Turing Way handbook. Uh, it's a community handbook. So if you click on this link, you would uh, get to see very beautiful illustrations uh, from the Turing Way community handbook. And all these illustrations are stored in the Zenodo repository um, uh, under CC BY 4.0 license. Uh, and uh, you can reuse these illustrations. So it's a very, uh, so it's a very nice uh, way of uh, storing uh, different file formats uh, at one place and also reshare it with others. Another uh, popular uh, repository or hosting platform is GitHub. On GitHub, you can store your data, you can store the results of your data, you can store your software, your code, and also version control it. So uh, you've written some part of the code now, and then you make some updates to it, and then later push that code to GitHub. So push is a language used very specific to GitHub. So you push code to GitHub, and there is a different version of the code available on GitHub. It also reached, uh, you can also go back to the previous version of your code. So it's a very nice way to store uh, your code. Very popularly, people store code uh, and software on GitHub, but you can also store your data sets and results on GitHub. So 
if you want to explore GitHub, uh, you can always explore the Open Life Science GitHub and you can see there are so many, there's so much information on it. You, know, you can also explore the NASA uh, TOPS Open Science 101 GitHub repository and you would see that all the lesson materials um, are available on that GitHub repository as well. So this is another nice uh, way or tool to store your uh, research work. Uh, uh, here is how a uh, GitHub repository would look. So this is the GitHub repository again of our dev guide. Uh, you can see different files uh, stored in it. So there is a .rmd file. Uh, there are some folders in it. Um, uh, so click on the link if you want to explore more about what the structure of GitHub looks like and what are the things that you can store on GitHub. All right, so again, time for our activity. Uh, so now what you could do is uh, you can type Zenodo on your computer or your laptop or GitHub, and then um, uh, you can uh, type uh, something from your domain. So for example, I would type uh, Zenodo and solar power forecasting, and then I would see if I can find some links on Zenodo about solar power forecasting or some data set on solar power on Zenodo or on GitHub. So this is what you need to do. Type Zenodo and then type the name of a data set or a software or a domain uh, that you're interested in, and then see if you can find some uh, information stored in it and see how it looks. This, this is your activity three, 75% of the session. Thank you, Sarajit. The uh, rooms are open. I think Thanks, I have Sarajit. a few people. Yeah, I'll pull to you aside. Let's see. For me, it doesn't appear yet, but I have to comment that I just put it human rights on GitHub and I'm amazed. <gasps> it's fantastic. It's a whole new world. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, and I can't see a, a, a breakout room to go. Let me. Okay. That's so nice. So happy. Yeah, I'm already really making my day. <laughs> I'm going to put you in room four with. Some other people. Thank you, Eden. See you soon. See you. Okay, everyone is back again. Uh, Sanjit, how are we doing with time? Uh, we're good. Uh, we have just one more part left and then it should be open for discussion. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, so, I so go ahead. Something with Priya and then uh, the communication cut off, but yeah, we can come back to it, Priya. Uh, all right, so the last part now is about uh, persistent identifiers, but let me, yeah. All right, so this is the last story that we need to think of. So it's uh, similar to the story that we, uh, or the scenario that we thought in part three, which is uh, uh, that you are a researcher and you are trying to understand the effects of a new medication on some health condition and then you are collecting data from different resources like patient demographics through surveys, through chemical lab tests, through medical records. So for example, there are three such researchers and they are collecting different forms of like such data. Then um, if you want to uniquely identify a particular data set that belongs to this researcher one or researcher two or researcher three, then uh, 
it won't be an efficient approach to go through the entire data set and understand which data set was collected by which researcher. So in such cases, uh, persistent identifiers help a lot uh, to uniquely identify uh, uh, the resource or the data set. So it's a uh, persistent identifier is a long lasting reference to a research resource. Um, it would uniquely point to the digital entity or uh, uh, the resource which is available digitally and also persistent identifiers are machine readable. So we'll try to see examples of what are persistent identifiers. Uh, the first one uh, that I would like to introduce here is the ORCID or the Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier. Um, so what this ORCID uh, or this ORCID ID as it's popularly called uh, does is it would uniquely identify an individual. So uh, ORCID ID is a 16 digit numeric code uh, that would uniquely identify a particular uh, researcher. So if you go on the website orchid.org, uh, you can create your own uh, profile there and you would get a orchid ID. Uh, on the slides, uh, I am showing you my orchid profile. Um, so it has my name and then there is this uh, circular button with the letters I and D. And then we have orchid.org slash uh, four times zero triple zero two seven zero three eight one four five seven. So I'm not trying to popularize my orchid ID, but uh, this is what you should uh, look at or call as your orchid ID. Like it would be unique to you. So if you uh, search this uh, ID, you would uh, get to come to my profile. And then under that, uh, you would get links to my works that have been attached to this ORCID ID. So this is a, a way to uniquely identify a, a researcher. So let us call it's the unique ID of a researcher. Okay, so what are the uh, benefits of ORCID ID? So like uh, tax ID numbers uh, uniquely identify an individual and how much tax they need to pay. ORCID ID can uniquely identify researchers and link uh, a researcher to the research that they have uh, conducted and the outputs that they have produced. And um, throughout one's career, uh, one can have the same uh, ORCID ID. So even if you're changing your uh, professions, you have your same, so you go to a different organization and you publish a new research paper there, but your ORCID ID would help you to link all the research papers that you have published. So it's it would uniquely uh, identify you as a researcher. Uh, then the next uh, persistent identifier is called the digital object identifier. So I was introduced to digital object identifiers or DOIs uh, when I was uh, working as a research fellow. And uh, I got really excited that uh, it would uniquely identify my research paper. So once I get a DOI for my paper and I put it on the internet and I look look up uh, what where it takes me to, it will always take me to that research paper. So this was a very exciting th thing for me when I learned it back then. Uh, so uh, digital ident or DOIs can be used to cite your data, your journal articles, your software, and then also uh, this uh, this is a more recent learning for me that you can also provide uh, DOIs to your slides, to your blog posts, to the videos that you put out, to any logos. So all these can be uniquely identified by a DOI. Um, so DOIs are uh, maintained and uh, provided by an organization called International Organization for Standardization. Um, if you look up doi.org, uh, you would get more details about this uh, persistent identifier. Uh, DOI so the yellow circle with the letters O I. Um, uh, so what uh, the DOI would do is because it's static. Um, it won't, uh, so if, if, if your research paper or your data set or your software 
or your slides have a DOI, whenever someone searches uh, using that DOI, they will always will always reach to your uh, your slides or your software, whatever is associated with that uh, way of uh, citing research products uh, and uh, making them more easier to share and easier to use. Okay, of DOI, uh, this uh, the uh, this text that is underlined ten point five zero six seven, the whole text that is underlined that is a DOI, and uh, whenever you put this text on the web browser, it will take you to this uh, website on Earth Data, and uh, you can get more information for on about that data set. So there is some Earth data set on this atmospheric data science uh, atmospheric science data center. And uh, you can, whenever you're using this DOI, you would land on this particular page and you can get to download this data, data set. All right, so uh, in summary, uh, how persistent identifiers work is um, you could provide, uh, so for example, if a researcher is writing some code and then they upload it to a repository and get a, a DOI for that uh, code, then whoever they share that DOI with, they can uh, come to the same code. Okay, then uh, the other one is, uh, if someone is uh, planning, a workshop community, uh, committee is planning to write a paper about the results of the workshop, then what they can do is each individual can collect their, uh, they can give, provide their ORCID IDs uh, and then include everyone in the paper just by linking their ORCID IDs and they submit a paper to a journal and the journal uniquely uh, provides a DOI to that paper. So this is another way of how persistent identifier would work in practice. Uh, so uh, these are some of the approaches uh, to um, help in your research journey uh, to uniquely identify your work. Uh, time for the last activity. Uh, it's called find and resolve a DOI. So it's not a reflection exercise, but more of a hands-on activity. Um, uh, so how you need to do this activity, there are certain steps that you need to follow and find and resolve. So what does resolve mean? I'll share it on the next slide. So resolving a DOI means you will be taken to the information that is uh, uniquely associated with that DOI. So what you need to do is uh, if uh, you have a, a data set or a software and you know uh, that it has a DOI, so you take that DOI and put it uh, in step two, you put it on the website doi.org. You scroll to the bottom of the website. There should be a section where it says try resolving a DOI name. So you put that name there, copy and paste it there, click on submit. And once you submit, see that uh, whether it takes you back to that software or data set page. Okay, so this is the task. If you don't know or if you're not aware of any DOIs, then uh, use the DOI that is provided in this task. So you go on this page, uh, point one, the second sub point, go on this page, identify what the DOI is, then uh, you uh, uh, complete uh, steps two, three, four, and five. So if you know about a DOI, if you are uh, aware that uh, a certain software has this DOI, you can directly test it. Or if not, then use the one on the slide. So everyone is back, I think. Oh no, we're missing one room.
Eh, ¿verdad? Ay, Now everyone is back, and this is the last part of the presentation. Yep. So this part is uh, uh, open discussion uh, for a few more minutes. So if anybody had any questions or wanted to share what they were discussing in their rooms, uh, feel free to self-nominate and share your thoughts, questions. Or any feedback? Okay, please. Uh, there's still my question in the other part. Um, so is it the same question, line number 67? Uh, I'm not sure if this was your question, but the question is, uh, when is it most suitable to document a research project or product software before, during, or after, or rather, could we do that in stages? If yes, please suggest a formula. Uh, so there is no one formula uh, to document your research work um, uh, because uh, for different domains or for different research projects, uh, for different research projects, uh, things happen at uh, different levels. So you might be collecting data set first and then writing the code, but then you might also be collecting a data set after writing that code. So uh, it really depends. So uh, what I would suggest is uh, at a stage where you are confident uh, that you have collected the required data set or you have written the um, appropriate amount of code, which is not too less or not too much, that is the stage where you should also think about writing uh, a documentation about the software. Um, for code, especially when you're writing code, uh, it's uh, it's actually better when you write the comments as you're writing the code and not later on. So you can make small comments uh, and then you can always uh, come back and rephrase them into more proper or structured sentences. So with code, I would really recommend that you're doing it as you write the code. So you make smaller comments and come back to them later on to make a full-fledged uh, documentation about the code that you have written. Uh, about data sets, uh, uh, usually uh, I, I would do it if I'm collecting the data set myself. So I'm collecting the data myself. Um, I'll keep uh, taking uh, brief notes uh, as I do it. And uh, at a stage where I have completed or completed the collection process, uh, then I would complete the documentation process too. Um, uh, however, uh, I would also say that because research processes, research is really iterative in nature. So you might want to revisit what you have written and update it at a later stage. So no one single formula of when uh, or how you should be documenting. It's uh, more of um, it, it more it it depends uh, or it varies from individual to individual. Uh, it's uh, the more important thing to remember is that you should document. So uh, <laughs> uh, try it, and if you if you don't want to write heavy documentation along with the work, you can always keep uh, making notes, and then you develop that notes at a later stage uh, when you think uh, things are much more stable. So now you can write proper documentation. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Um, Uh, I so there is another question from Johanna. Uh, hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Uh, uh, this is from... I think yeah. Johanna needs a few minutes to wrap up. Could you, I get you to just answer that in the chat? Would that be okay? Or the ether yeah, 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 I'll do that. So I'll answer that in the ether pad. Yeah, thank you, Sarenjit. Um, I wanted to share a few announcements. Oh, please. Um, Join me in giving Sarenjit a round of applause. This was an amazing, an amazing session. And I hope everyone learned something in regard, regard related to one of these 
really foundational tools of open science that we're going to see over and over in the next weeks. Um, so thank you. It's been a really great pleasure having you, uh, who originally were part of the team who developed the materials for NASA, and now you're here with us uh, providing this training. So it's been a, a great, great pleasure. Um, just a few announcements. Tomorrow, Friday, we have an optional um, office hours. It's at, at 11 UTC. So you can see the, uh, the uh, link to join in Slack. Uh, we usually share that a few hours, like maybe an hour um, before the session starts. And this is optional. This is a space where you can come um, with questions, with project updates. Um, if there was something that you wanted to continue discussing, this could be the place to come. It's very casual. You can drop in and off whenever you want. And there will always be someone from the OLS team. Um, so it's earlier than the sessions uh, for people who just find that time easier. And next week, we are going to cover the data module. So again, diving deeper into metadata, into documentation specifically for data. And the last announcement is that most people have received the introduction email uh, with your coach. So please try to arrange a meeting before the end of next week. Uh, and we have still a couple of people that I am um, finishing that assignment of experts and projects, so bear with me. Uh, but I think that's all for the session. Again, thank you everyone for, for your participation and thank you, Sanjit. So I'm gonna stop the recording now.